Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're going inside a flower in search of the secrets of how species evolve. Oh, are we doing that thing where we shrink down into bee size and then go flower to flower asking questions? Like, how did you evolve? How did you evolve? (laughs) We're taking a different approach, and it's even smaller. We're going to walk on DNA. Before we get started with this episode, we need to say we're on the second part of a two-part series about the yellow monkey flower. If you haven't listened to part one, which ended on an incredible cliffhanger, go back and do listen now. It will help this episode make a lot more sense. (laughs) But we'll do a quick recap now. Ooh, wait. Last time on Tumble Science Podcast for Kids. We met David Lowry, a biologist who is studying monkey flowers, which is a flower that really doesn't look like a monkey. Some people can see the monkey better than other people. And he's using it to learn how plants are adapted to grow in different places. And he's focusing on two types of monkey flowers. One that grows on the Pacific coast, and the other lives a few miles inland. And these plants look almost nothing alike. So David wanted to know whether they were actually the same species. Long story short, he went out to collect both types of monkey flowers from the wild, Then he did some experiments in a greenhouse to find out what makes them look so different. And it's all about the water, the amount of water they get. So that was David's first discovery about how monkey flowers were driven to adapt or change in different environments. And he thought that they were different species, but not all scientists agree with him. So studying these monkey flowers has made it glaringly clear to me that we don't have a great idea of exactly what a species is or whether we can actually name things as separate species. So we ended the episode asking, what is a species? Why do we have different species? Why aren't we all the same species? Those are really big questions. So um, where are we now? How how are we going to answer the questions in this episode? Because we'd better. (laughs) You know, they're very hard questions, but David believes that the monkey flower can help us find the answers because all the answers are actually rooted in the idea of evolution, the process by which organisms change or evolve over generations. I would say monkey flowers are amazing organisms for understanding how life evolves on Earth. So he's saying the answers are in the flower, just waiting to be plucked and discovered. It's a little more complicated than picking a flower. David is using the science of DNA to understand what's behind the monkey flower's adaptations, because those are the changes that cause life to evolve and become what we think of as different species. What do you mean by what's behind the adaptation? Like, didn't we find out that it's water? Yes, access to water is the reason why monkey flowers made its adaptations. But what make those differences stick from generation to generation is actually part of the plant itself. That's what David's experiments from the previous episode proved about monkey flowers. The basic idea is if you take any organisms, fish, flies, humans, whatever, and if you grew them in the exact same environment, If they end up being different from each other, then you can attribute those differences to genetic differences. Huh. So what does he mean by genetic differences? It's the tiny differences in DNA or genetic code that are found inside the cells of every living thing. They provide the set of instructions for how the plant should grow. That set of DNA is called the genome. And that's where David went looking for the pieces of genetic code that are specifically behind the monkey flower's adaptations. We are able to track down different regions of those genomes that cause the differences between them. What David discovered in the genomes of monkey flowers is a key to how new species are created. Wait, wait. So back up a second. How did he do all that? Do you just like look at a genome, like whatever that is, and be like, oh, yeah, there it is. It's it's right here. Here's the answer to what created biodiversity. It's right under the microscope right now. All done. 
We'll find out right after this quick break. Okay, we're back. So before the break, I teased that David had made a big discovery by studying the genes of monkey flower, a discovery that could tell us something about how all life on Earth evolved into different species. I do want to know how he did that. It feels like a science magic trick, like, boom, I've got a coin and here is DNA. (laughs) No, the discovery is a real journey, and it starts with some good old fashioned plant breeding. So we actually got these things together in the laboratory and crossed them and made hybrids between the coast inland plants. David bred or crossed the coastal monkey flower with the inland monkey flowers, and they had babies called hybrids. That's the word for the offspring of two organisms that have different characteristics or traits. So what do they look like? They are actually giants and they flower early. So it's kind of surprising. They're beasts of plants. Beasts of plants? Oh man, is it like like a little shop of horrors thing? Are they like running through the lab eating people left and right? No, they're not. Ian, he didn't really care what they looked like. But I wasn't as interested in that. Making hybrids or crossing two organisms is actually a way to see what's really going on on the inside of plants. Crossing things together is really important because it's like sticking the two organism genomes in a blender and mixing them. Ah, so he's making life smoothies. (laughs) So we know that in our own families, we blend traits together. Each parent passes down traits or characteristics to their children on a package of DNA called a chromosome. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and monkey flowers have 14. And I'm not going to get into the details of how this works, but that mixing and the experiments we can do afterwards is the way we link particular chromosomes to differences between organisms. So why is he not going into the details? Are they secret? (laughs) No, you'll just have to take an entire genetics class to make it make sense. I guess I'm okay with that for now. (laughs) (laughs) The point is, this is a way to narrow down the search area from the entire genome to just a small part of the genome. The idea is that we're essentially taking a chunk of DNA and we're trying to shrink down the region that we think controls this difference between coast and inland plants until we shrink it down to a single gene. Okay, so bottom line, there's a way to search for the part of the DNA that's responsible for the adaptation. You got it. So it causes them to be either big or small, flower early or flower late. The next step, it's pretty cool. So then we do a thing, sometimes you call it chromosome walking. Wait, he's like literally walking on a chromosome? Not literally. I do not have a little spacecraft that shrinks down to the size of a chromosome. I do not get out onto the chromosome and literally walk along it. No, it's more complicated than that. So this isn't a magic school bus situation. Scientists don't have the technology of the magic school bus to do this. <laughs> Where is Mrs. Frizzle when you need her? <laughs> so, but, but he's saying that it's more complicated than figuring out how to shrink yourself down to the size of a chromosome, because that seems pretty complicated to me. Well, what chromosome walking actually is, is a process to spot check each gene and find out if it's the one that's causing the difference. It involves a lot more crosses. Yay, genetics. Yay, genetics. <laughs> it takes a long time. It's not a chromosome walk in the park. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. David would chromosome walk until the wee hours of the morning. I would stay up late until 2 a.m. in the morning, working with DNA day after day after day after day. And then something stopped him in his tracks. What? What was it? And so I had this big chunk of DNA that I couldn't get through. It was like a wall, a barrier. Hold on. How, how can a chunk of DNA be like a wall? Well, it was a chunk of DNA where there was no way to pull out and examine a single gene because the genes were locked together. All 700 of these genes and all 700 of these genes are locked together in what we call a super gene. Wait, a super gene, does that give the plant superpowers? <laughs> Maybe in a way. <laughs> <laughs> 
So David could see that both plant parents had passed down their own super genes to their hybrid child. They were the same code, but it was like they were written or flipped in opposite directions. Oh, so like one was written backwards? Yeah. David knew of other scientists whose dreams of finding a single gene had been ruined by these messed up chunks of DNA in different organisms. I had the same kind of feeling that this was the end of the line for this study. I could publish this result and that would be it. And I would move on with my life after that. Well, okay. So I guess he thought his like quest was over. I thought I hit a brick wall and possibly I'd wasted years of my life. But fortunately, that was not the case. Oh, that's good. No wasting years of your life, David. (laughs) Happy for you. But how? He took a little break from looking at his DNA and started reading about other people's research around these flipped super genes. And he found there was a reason for hope. So other people had had this issue, but there was also a lot of discussion going on, sort of at a low level, that these big chunks of DNA could be the key to how lots of organisms evolve adaptations. Oh, so let me get this straight. So David had been looking for a single gene to explain how the monkey flower got its adaptation. But it might actually be these big chunks of genes that are locked together that combine to make the adaptation? Yes. And then a path forward opened up. Then I was able to do a bunch of experiments to show that that inversion or backwards flip chunk of DNA actually underlied a lot of the differences between these coast and inland populations. David realized that these chunks of DNA were not the problem. They were the solution. That was one of the biggest discoveries that we made in all of this research. Whoa. And since then, many other people have found that inversions are involved in adaptations of all different kinds of organisms, from birds to butterflies to various crops, all kinds of things. And they're very important. Oh, wow. So it's not just the monkey flower. Like, all sorts of organisms have these flipped chunks or inversions inside their DNA. Yes. Even us. So, for example, humans and chimpanzees differ by a number of different large inversions, just like the ones in the monkey flower. That's crazy. So we can actually see how we became different from our primate cousins? Like, how we became not chimps or human? Feels very personal. Yeah, these inversions are in us. And it's like a window into the process of how species are created or diverge from each other. Those changes are actually recorded in our DNA, even when they happened millions of years ago. And that's the amazing thing about life, is that all life is based off DNA, is its form of holding information. So basically, we can get information from a plant that David picked up on the side of a road and learn more about how all species adapt and evolve to become different. Exactly. Pick your flowers. They're not just pretty. (laughs) All life follows a certain set of rules, and we can learn those rules from different organisms and put all of those findings together to get a better understanding of how life works in general. So the monkey flower, in addition to not looking like a monkey, is one of our teachers in the School of Life. In a way. (laughs) But why does it matter? I mean, it's cool to know what's going on to actually make adaptations happen, but is this useful in some other way? Yeah, it is. Because the more we understand the rules of life, the more we're prepared to adapt to changes in the future, like climate change. What David is learning from the monkey flower could be applied to other plants that need to adapt to changing conditions very quickly. So it's like once we learn the rules, we can then play the game. The game starts with a plant. Could we say that David's a master of plant games? He's learning how to become a plant game master. He's a plant dungeon master. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have like a, a D&D group that's only plants? <laughs> it's P&P, plants and plants. <laughs> plants and plants. <laughs> I asked David how being a plant scientist has changed how he sees the world. Do you ponder every flower and blade of grass that you see now? I don't have time for every blade of grass. (laughs) But some of them, some of them I spend a lot of time with. (laughs) 
<laughs> that really makes lying down in the grass seem a lot more worthwhile. Yeah, when someone asks, what are you doing just lying down in the grass? You can say, I'm pondering the rules and evolution of life. That's what scientists do. Now that you've learned how plant scientists study evolution, think about your favorite plant and how it evolved. First, make a list of its most interesting traits or characteristics. Can you think of any other plants that share those traits? Think about how those plants might share a common ancestor. How did they become different? Once you have your hypothesis, look up information about your favorite plant with a parent or caregiver to find out where scientists think your plant lives on the tree of life. Thanks today to Dr. David Bryant Lowry, professor of plant biology at Michigan State University. Hear more from our interview with David on the special bonus interview episode that's available to Patreon members who pledge at the $1 level or higher at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll also have more free resources on our website where you can get a link to a comic book that David and his lab wrote about monkey flower discovery. That's really cool, and it's on the blog at sciencepodcastforkids.com. This material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation under grant number 2153100, Imagine the Genetic, Developmental, and Physiological Mechanisms of Plant Local Adaptation to Oceanic Salt Spray. Sarah Robertson Lentz is our editor and designed the episode art. Elliot Hijaj is our production assistant. Gary Calhoun-James is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Science Podcast for Kids.